Good evening, everybody. I am Betsy Fisher Martin, the executive director of the White House of University. And welcome to our weekly virtual series, Women on Wednesdays. To those of you new to one of our events, WPI is a nonprofit and nonpartisan institute in AU School of Public Affairs that aims to close the gender gap in political leadership. And we offer academic and practical campaign training, and we facilitate research and discussions like this on women in politics. So tonight, we wanted to look at the dynamics at play in this election through the lens of both gender and age. What are the issues that young women, the Generation Zers care most about and what will motivate them to vote? And then looking to the other end of the voting age spectrum, what do women 50 plus care about and what can we expect uh, from them on election day? Um, we are excited to have with us a great panel to help navigate these questions and more. Uh, Sarah Guillermo is the executive director of Ignite. Uh, which focuses on the political engagement of young women, and she will tell us more about that in a minute. Uh, Nancy Lamond, who is, of course, the Executive Vice President and Chief Advocacy and Engagement Officer at AARP, and Dr. Melissa Deckman, who studies this very topic as a professor and chair of the Political Science Department at Washington College. She is also a proud AU alum, having earned her, both her master's and PhD in political science in our School of Public Affairs. So welcome all of you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Before Thank you. we start, I want to let everybody know that we're going to save some time for questions. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will see an ask the question prompt. So. We encourage you to type in some questions, and if you see other questions that you're interested in, you can upvote those uh, as well. And if you miss any of our discussion or want to replay it or share it with friends, a replay will be available uh, at the same link to use to register. So uh, Sarah, Nancy, Melissa, welcome. Uh, no good discussion of politics uh, would be complete without some polling data. Uh, so I know uh, Sarah and Melissa have some Gen Z survey data to share with us. And Nancy and the AARP have been doing a series of in-depth polls on older voters, and she's going to share some of their findings as well to frame our discussion. So Sarah, while I'm pulling up your slides, give us a brief overview of Ignite and what you guys are doing. Perfect. Thank you, Betsy. Um, we're so grateful to be here this evening. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Guillermo, Ignite's Executive Director. Ignite is a national 501c3. Um, that builds politically ambition in, in young women to ultimately run for office. So we're a movement of young women who are ready and eager to become the next generation of political leaders. And we are in about 36 different states across the country. We recruit, we train, um, and really support young women at the school age level, um, all the way through college and graduate school um, as they build their political ambition, train them. Um, and we have so many young women on the ballot for 2020 this year that we're super excited about. Um, and then a really fun fact um, that you'll learn about our work is that over 90% of our young women who are eligible to vote um, voted in the 2018 midterm. So we're very excited. Many of them have already turned in their ballot as we get ready for um, this election that is currently happening. Um, so I'm gonna pass it on over to Melissa. We have been doing such phenomenal work together um, over the past, I feel like it's been two, almost two years now. Um, and so she'll share more about the work that we're doing. Great, thank you, Sarah. Let me just also say that um, I'm very happy to be here. Can you hear me? Hold on one second, uh, Melissa, because we're just getting um, some bad feedback there from you. Do you have two windows open maybe on your computer? Um, let me see, I do. All right, is this better? Yes. Okay. Good. I apologize. Boy, no what a grand debut when I return to my alma mater here. But I am so happy to be here this evening. I just wish we could be in person on AU's lovely campus. I have many very good memories uh, at AU. But it's been a sheer delight to work with Sarah and the folks at um, Ignite uh, National over the last couple of years. And so we're going to present a few findings from um, some surveys that we've done over the past year and a half, roughly, um, in July of 2019. We surveyed more than 2,000 Gen Z Americans uh, nationally. And so we're going to look at some of that data. And then we also did a follow-up survey 
just this past year in May to get an idea of how their partisanship, how Gen Z's partisanship has changed perhaps, and maybe to see if their issue priorities have changed as well. But the first slide I wanted to bring up here comes from the uh, July 2019 survey. And I think it's really important to remember in our conversation about Gen Z voters, just how diverse they are and how that's really driving a lot of their political views and their partisanship. And so in our survey, 54% of Gen Z Americans identified as white, 13% as black, 24% as Latina, 4% as Asian, and 5% as mixed or other. And that's pretty close to what we're seeing demographically with census data as well. Another way that Gen Z is very different than older Americans is with respect to sexual orientation and gender identity. And so roughly one in four uh, Gen Z Americans identify as LGBTQ. Uh, which I think is really different from older Americans. And again, it's driving some of their viewpoints when it comes to politics and civil rights. Last but not least, on the last slide, we're looking at religion. Gen Z Americans are a lot less religious than older Americans. 40% um, in fact, describe themselves as religiously unaffiliated. Um, and that helps to explain why we're finding only about 47% say that they don't go to church very often. Again, that's very different from the types of voters um, that Nancy's going to be talking about a little bit later in the show. Okay, next slide, please. So one of the things we've been tracking is um, how Gen Z identifies itself with respect to partisanship. And so the data here are showing <coughs> Gen Z voters broken down by men and women voters. And in 2019, 57%, if you go to the top line of Gen Z women, identified themselves as a Democrat, or their independents who lean Democrat. So we're basically collapsing the independents who lean one way or the other and separating out what we political scientists would call the true independents. But what's really striking for us in the last year has been the extent to which Gen Z women have become even more democratic or democratic leaning. So it goes from 57% to 69% in our survey from last May, which I think is really interesting and probably perhaps troubling if you're a Republican. Um, but if you look down below, what's happening is that Gen Z women are increasingly rejecting the Republican party and those that are independent are beginning to uh, categorize themselves more as Democrats. So next slide. Okay. Sarah, picking up. <laughs> yeah, so this one, as Melissa was sharing, there's been a huge shift um, in this particular generation in who they're potentially going to be voting for. So a couple of things just to note on this um, slide. One is these are not the same samples of humans. We had a different sample group in 2019 versus the sample group in 2020, um, but it's still hypersensitive and hyper um, reflective of Gen Z across the entire country. So a couple of things that I want to show you that um, you may not see because of the cutoffs. So in 2019, Gen Z were really preferring both from young men and young women that we were surveying the Democratic candidate. Um, and then for folks that were really appealing towards Trump in 2019, there was still a really massive split in thinking about why they were voting. And so we're not showing you all of the different details around this, but the big split was really truly around um, religion and evangelicals. Um, so that's a really interesting takeaway from this particular data. Um, you can see that men, which is the green yellowish color are voting for Trump a lot more than women are. Um, and so that's another really key piece. And then obviously right now in 2020, when we did the survey, it was um, the week before, um, a week in May before George Floyd's murder. So it was a really big difference too of thinking about who folks were voting for and who they're primed to voting for as well. And so big key takeaway here is that there's just a really large gender difference between who folks are voting for, whether it was the name candidate or Trump. Great. And I think we can go to the next slide, which is one of my favorite slides. So this slide is um, for personally relevant issues. So we were super curious for the young women, what issues matter most to you and why are you going to the ballot box? And so we say pre-COVID world because this was taken in 2019. So the top four issues are mass shootings, climate change, education, and then the fourth one is racial inequality. Um, we're clearly not post-COVID yet, <laughs> but in the May um, 2020 timeframe, you can see that healthcare and jobs 
went up a lot higher for young women. Mass shootings and racial inequality stayed on for them. Um, I want to highlight that for um, reproductive health, because that's always a big question for us, that was the fifth layer lingering part always for either 2019 and 2020. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight is thinking about Gen Z young men. For them, um, jobs was always number one for them. That didn't change um, in 2019 versus 2020. And I would suspect if we did the survey again today, that would still hold true. Um, and then the other piece is even during the time of COVID right now, for men, healthcare was still like a distant third um, and education debt for them was number two. So that's also just an interesting difference um, based on gender um, and how young women are choosing to vote based on these different um, issues that are impacting them every day. That's really interesting. Um, I'm curious, um, Nancy, how some of these issues, I mean, I would assume, and you're going to tell us here about healthcare and jobs being number one, um, probably very similar for older Americans as well, right? Absolutely. Um, health care is the single most important issue for people over the age of 65. And if you're between 50 and 64, health care is a little stronger than the economy, but not much. Interesting. Um, I know you have some slides also. Let me just pull those up for folks. Uh, okay. And then uh, you can talk us through some of uh, some of your findings uh, as well. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Be sharing. Great. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, thanks for having me. And I will go through very quickly and uh, we can uh, drill down during Q&A on anything. Yeah. So, my, my first, uh, before I get actually to that point, um, I just wanted to mention that uh, the 50 plus woman voting cohort is very big. It's mm -hmm. 62 million. Uh, in fact, there are 4 million women voters over the age of 85. Wow. Um, they're not a monolith and they are not as diverse as younger generations, as you've heard. Um, but 50 plus women have a range of backgrounds and life experiences. Seven in 10 are white. Seven in 10 do not have college degrees. Half are single, either separated, divorced, widowed, or never married. And the average income is $36,000 a year. So that gives you some sense of the older, the older woman. Um, this slide that we're at now uh, makes a general point that as voters, uh, they punch above their weight, especially in the battleground states. Overall, 50 plus women were about 20% of the population, 30% of the electorate in 2018. And in key battleground states, 50 plus women were around a quarter of the voting population, close to or more than a third of actual voters. And given what we expect with turnout, um, we, uh, we, we uh, expect that that will, will hold true this time. I should say that older voters in general turn out or have turned out at much higher rates than younger voters. In 2018, if you were over 65, 70% of you voted. Um, and if you were roughly 30 to 39, 40% voted. I think one of the things we're gonna watch in this election is uh, those numbers, particularly of younger voters increase. At the same time, I think older voters will also continue to turn out at that rate. Um, next slide. Um, older women voters are not a lock for either party. And again, on all these slides, there's a lot more detail than I'll talk about. But in 2016, President Trump won 50 plus overall men and, uh, men and women together and split women 50 plus pretty much down the middle. Women 50 plus of color favored Clinton 82 to 16 and 50 plus white women swung for Trump by 17 points. The story of the last election was the older voter, typically the older white voter of both genders who delivered mightily for President Trump. In 2018, when democratic control of the house moved and was powered in part by 50 plus women who reduced their commitment to uh, Republicans 
and instead voted more for uh, Democrats. Um, one of the emerging stories in 2020, I'm sure we'll talk about it, is that uh, Vice President Biden has done considerably better uh, with the 65 plus um, as we approach the election. And he's running basically even with President Trump in the 50 to 64 year olds. Next slide. Yeah. So um, the general point here and in the next few slides that I'll go through very quickly is that older women are among the most anxious voters. They were more concerned than older men about financial security and health care before the pandemic, and they are even more worried now. And the reason for this is quickly this slide. Women start out earning less than their male counterparts, and that gender gap persists through their long-term financial security. They have more time out of the workforce to raise kids, care for loved ones, Lower lifetime earnings and annual incomes means less savings and lower social security benefits and longer life expectancy means savings need to stretch farther. It's almost impossible to overstate the anxiety level of older women as they're going into this election. Next slide. Women call themselves the chief healthcare officer when we do polling. And many of them said that if they didn't manage the health of their household, it wouldn't get done. Four out of 10 say they cannot afford healthcare. This just gives you some taste of how, uh, how, how trying that is for people and also how important healthcare is. And by the way, the older you get, the more healthcare is also an economic issue. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And you can skip right over that slide. Um, I have a series of slides here that really challenge uh, people of all ages, uh, eyeglass potential, um, but, um, but I'll, I'll summarize them fairly quickly. We've consistently seen in AARP polling that during the pandemic, older women are more worried than older men, that their family will get sick, they will get COVID, and that their social security benefits will be cut. And a significant portion are also worried about affording healthcare and retirement. And there's a lot of concern generally about America becoming more divided. Next slide. This is the one about healthcare costs. You can see it by state, how important it is. And next slide. Uh, this is about not being able to retire. Again, this speaks to the kind of lifelong pay equity challenge, lifelong taking time out of the workforce. Next slide. And again, um, this, is, um, this is a generation, or I should say we are a generation that remembers what it was like when um, policy, policymakers and public officials worked together to address long-term problems. And so consistently we see the major concern of older Americans when they vote is that the country is so divided. <laughs> Next slide. And this is uh, my last slide without any great detail on it. Uh, I just wanted to mention quickly the issues that we're yeah, seeing yeah. At, at the top of the agenda and then we can go to Q and A. Um, every election cycle, no matter what else is happening, Social Security and Medicare are the top issues for older Americans. The specific parts of the issues could be a little different, but Social Security, its long-term uh, sustainability and the fact that uh, people are worried about cuts is always important. Medicare being strong in this particular stage, people are very concerned about prescription drug costs. Interestingly, this go round and COVID undoubtedly fueled this. We've done work at ARP for years on caregiving. We've seen an explosion in the support for paid family leave and tax credits for caregivers. And those cut across all of our age groups, 50 and above. And it also cuts across Republican, Democrat, Independent. So uh, the issues of healthcare, which are uh, important to uh, younger women, are uh, very important to older women. Interesting. Melissa, as the, the political scientist in the group here, what jumps out at you from some of the slides that Nancy just shared um, 
you know, the differences now even to pre-COVID and post-COVID and, and what's on the voters' minds as they um, get ready to vote in 20 days? Sure. I'm, I'm really struck with the extent to which healthcare is becoming such a huge issue uh, mm -hmm. in this election. And I think it's, you know, you see this in other polling, not probably not just in Nancy's work here, but um, I'm really almost shocked at the extent to which older women especially are really um, beginning to favor Joe Biden in this election cycle. And I think it's a direct result of how Trump has handled uh, COVID. Um, I did, wasn't aware that uh, older women were far more likely to actually be fearful of getting COVID. In fact, I thought that was yeah. an interesting finding. Yeah. Uh, again, that just I think plays into the importance that healthcare um, plays in our elections in recent cycles. I mean, 2018, I think, was a really referendum on the Affordable Care Act, right? That's really why I think um, older voters, as you suggested, Nancy, handed the House of, uh, House of, uh, House of Representatives back to the, the Democratic Party. And so it, that's kind of only on steroids, to use a poor medical <laughs> term, right? Uh, that essentially, because of COVID, women are already anxious about uh, health care. But again, in 2020, I think that this potentially has been a boon for the Democratic ticket. There's so, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, Sarah, in terms of younger women, do you have you guys picked up this? Obviously, you, they're concerned about health care. You showed a little bit of the disparity and sort of not all that surprising, right? That young men think that they're invisible, invincible, excuse me, and, you know, are, is worried. But do you see that sort of anxiety forming among young people like Nancy was talking about with older women? Yeah, I was actually just going to comment on that when you I wrote down most anxious voters. And yeah. <laughs> because I mean, I think, you know, when we were shifting all of our programming um, virtually in March, and I'm based in California, so we were making a lot of decisions a lot sooner than a lot of the other states that we operated across the country. And like, I have to tell you, the number one thing was like taking care of our young women, opening up spaces for them because suddenly they were isolated. Um, and now we're translating that into like creating your voting plan where they're still isolated. They don't know, they don't have their jobs anymore. They don't know if they're gonna go to school or like what school. I can't tell you how many young women were enrolled to go to college this year that are forced to take gap years because they can't go <laughs> and i think where you know you're really talking about the pay equity gap and like how big it is and i made a comment i was like i bet this is like really wider for women of color when you're talking about thirty-six thousand as the median income for this voting block like if you live in california that's not going to get you anywhere you can't even pay rent unless you own your house and so like when i think about that for our young women there are some very clear pieces that are happening cross-generationally. And I know a lot of our young women are living with their parents and living with their grandparents during this time. So if they weren't seeing it, now they are. <laughs> and I think that they are commiserating around these particular issues that they're constantly facing um, and are gonna continue to face. And we don't have the, the polling data on this um, because we were, we were talking about sort of the younger women and then the 50 plus, but there's that generation in the middle, right, Melissa, too, that are women, you know, 30 to 50, right, that have young children at home, most likely, who are really facing the anxiety of trying to um, care and school their children while also trying to work. Yeah, this is the sandwich generation. They yeah. often have to deal with elder parents as well. But when it comes to, I think, the homeschooling, I mean, I'm pretty fortunate. I have an 11-year-old and a 14-year-old, and so they're a little bit self-sufficient. But, you know, I have friends with uh, kids in kindergarten through elementary school, and it's almost a full-time job, and they're still trying to work at home. So the level of anxiety for a lot of women voters, these women are disproportionately, you know, the caregivers at home. We know that through all the studies that we've seen over the years. I think that has just made them more angry. And they're, they're really, I think, key on voting. I've seen data showing the excitement about voting this, this year to be higher than it's been um, in decades. One study is suggesting that we might see voter turnout as high as it was in, in 1908. They're thinking there's going to be a hundred year surge of voter turnout. And a lot of it's women, women who are really at their wit's end, right? They're anxious, they're angry about the state of the country, they're angry about the tone of politics. And I think definitely we see women across generations are driving a lot of this. Nancy, in your research, what do you see? Because you're you're polling 50 plus women, but then you also do a breakout of sort of the 65 plus. 
what differences do you see among those two groups um, in terms of issues um, and also in terms of um, swinging from Trump voters to Biden? Yeah. Um, well, uh, again, for the 65 plus, yeah. COVID is uh, and the virus itself is absolutely the issue. Uh, for 50 to 64 year olds, uh, the virus is an issue along with the economic situation. And, right. and you, you all described it beautifully. It's jobs. It's uh, many still have children going to school, et cetera. So that is the, the biggest difference we see um, among those two groups. We see consistently high numbers across both age cohorts on intention to vote. Um, as a matter of fact, I was struck you used uh, something like a 95% figure for younger women. That's what we see with older women, and it's consistent across, um, across all of the age groups. The older you are, the more likely you are to vote by mail. Mm -hmm. um, although it's still not, it's still kind of about, when we polled a while ago, it was around 55%. It wasn't as high as we thought it would be. But um, as we're getting closer to actual uh, experience, I think the older you are, the more likely you are to vote by, by mail. And um, I have a, a small prediction or a kind of uh, clarion call for people in, in <laughs> politics, which is that um, uh, the next big issue for older Americans is the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And while it's an issue for everyone, um, if you're over the age of 65, you've listened to countless reports saying how vulnerable you are. And you're in the sea of confusing information right now. And how candidates, uh, and you know, the day after the election, we have a new set of candidates, how candidates begin to position and address on the vaccine, I think is going to speak volumes in terms of how well they do in the next election cycle. Interesting. Sarah, um Nancy was talking about uh, mail-in voting, absentee voting. It, as we know, you know, women, uh, older women, turn out, you know, much at much higher rates uh, to vote in elections. What do we know about younger women um, this time in terms of being more politically motivated to actually turn out and vote? Do you, are you picking that up places? Uh, we there's a lot every year. We started talking about the youth vote, and then it doesn't actually materialize. Um, what do you think about this year? Yeah, I, there was one more slide that I don't think we did today, but it was really the millennial generation. So me, Sarah, generation of millennials yeah. and then the Gen Z generation. So they started voting in 2014. And so um, thinking about the midterms for them, young women at that point were voting at about 35%. And so when you think about the data of folks that turn out to the midterms, that usually has a much higher impact in the general election. And so that's been really exciting, I think, in really kind of creating predictions of how Gen Z will turn out. Um, we know that like Gen Z and millennials make up nearly 40% of this electorate. And so there's definitely a lot of power um, behind that. Um, we, I was sharing earlier that we did a poll of our young women, just the Ignite universe, <laughs> so not the entire Gen Z population, but we do know that a lot of them are voting by mail and a lot of them are voting early, nearly over 95% um, are choosing one of those two buckets. So we're clearly in a very unprecedented time. And so voting by mail and getting an absentee ballot um, in states that even allow it has been totally confusing for young folks. Um, and particularly, we had young women that were going to school in Alabama or in Georgia, started school, had a COVID outbreak, had to leave campus, and now are either still in the state or need to go back to their home state. And where is their ballot? <laughs> and right. so for me, I'm a longtime voter in California. My ballot just arrived today. <laughs> and so I think that there's a lot of different barriers that folks are facing right now that are very different um, and things that we continue to prepare for at Ignite. But we're also cognizant that um, there are just variables right now that we could never have predicted. Melissa, I see you shaking your head. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll go back to that. Um, yeah. So uh, the, the slide that we were going to show, if, if you looked from 2014 to 2018 and you looked at the youngest voters, um, 18 to 24, 
Um, 18% of women voted in 2014 in the midterms, which was very, very low. That was a kind of a record low. Um, it was still higher than men, about 16%. Those numbers more than doubled, though, in 2018, which I think is a reflection of unhappiness among younger voters with Donald Trump. Um, and so what I think we're going to find in this election cycle is that Gen Z women will outperform Gen Z men when it comes to the ballot box, much like the, the voting patterns for older generations as well. And I would just add to that too, yeah. the other things we've been studying with Ignite and my research is looking at overall levels of political engagement. And in fact, what we're seeing with Gen Z is this sort of unprecedented reverse gender gap in political participation. So we know in recent years, women and men have sort of caught up when it comes to political participation, whether it's volunteering for campaigns or giving donations or writing their member or going to a local meeting or what have you. But among this generation, we're finding that young women are far more motivated, statistically significantly more likely to be involved in politics. So I think that's really something to watch as we move forward, even past this election cycle, the role that women will be playing as change agents, I think, in American politics. Mm -hmm. Nancy, what do we know about the motivation of older women? I mean, you talked about sort of the anxiety, but that's not necessarily a motivator to go vote, or is it? And um, what do we know about sort of the political engagement that older women are putting in this election in terms of not just voting, but um, volunteering on campaigns, making phone calls, donating money, that kind of thing? Yeah, I um, uh, pol uh, political engagement is is high. I don't have uh, data on it, but I know from our own volunteers, and of course, our volunteer work is nonpartisan. Uh, ARP doesn't endorse; we don't give yeah. money. Uh, but um, they are very engaged. Now they're engaged in different ways. You know, people used to laugh. I'd hear from candidates, "Oh, I saw your red shirts at my rally," um, and so they're used to being out and about and asking questions. And so it's much more virtual this time. But our level of engagement has been very, very high. Uh, so too with volunteering. We have a number of programs, including a community connections program, where you can sign up to call people who are isolated, might be in nursing homes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's not political activity, but the number of people who've signed up far surpassed what, what we expected. Um, and we think, it's, we think it's going to continue. I don't have figures on political giving. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, Here's a, a good question in the queue here uh, from Dr. Barbara Johnson, and she wants to know, she said she's glad to see that the 50 plus research was able to segment and identify rural versus urban women. And she wants to know, has this been explored for the younger cohort? So Sarah, Melissa, what do we know about young women in rural versus urban environments? Well, I would say that, um, you know, there are similar trends nationally. I think that when you live in rural areas, disproportionately you tend to be, I think, whiter, slightly more Republican. Um, but generally speaking, I think the overall trend for younger Americans is for them to lean really to the left more politically, even in rural areas, but certainly not to the same extent as you see in urban areas, I would say. Yeah, and I think the engagement, the political engagement level is, uh, is way different in our rural communities. Um, than our um, urban communities, just how people participate in GOTV, how our college chapters engage with their members. Um, and some of the key differences is literally just transportation. So like, if you can't get to the meeting, you can't get to the meeting. And right now it's like, do I have access to internet to even get onto the Zoom? Yeah. So yeah. We're seeing some of those really big differences. And that really plays out in election season because if you don't have a working phone or an in, or internet, mm -hmm. how can people get to you? You can't necessarily just drop off all of your mailers, you know, 10 times to do 10 touch points when you're a candidate. And so like I have a, a young woman running for a Kansas State House right now and she's, you know, campaigning on a reservation. And so it's really different of how she's trying to meet her community where they're at. Um, and so there's some, you know, that's her campaign. And then I have a candidate running in Oakland <laughs> City Council. And that's a really different way of um, meeting her voters where they're at. Interesting. Um, here's a question from Isabel. Um, and she wants to know, um, for each of the panelists, who, what do you make of the Trump, Pence, and Biden-Harris campaigns 
respective efforts, and then she has in parentheses or lack thereof, uh, to woo women voters? I can go first on yeah. that. Um, I've been uh, researching a book about gender, Gen Z, and political engagement. So I've been talking to a lot of um, very highly engaged political activists. So these aren't the run-of-the-mill Gen Z Americans, right? So they're very much engaged. They're leading organizations. They're marching in the streets and all of that. But from their perspective, um, they're still pretty disillusioned with, with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Um, I think that they feel that the Democratic Party should listen to more what they have to say. Their priorities, such as climate change, you know, gun reform, um, mm -hmm. income inequality, uh, and of course, racial inequality, they feel like these candidates are just maybe giving them more band-aid responses as opposed to systematic change. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, they're not going to go vote for Donald Trump. So the I think the the uh, sort of uh, equation that the Biden-Harris team has to, to factor in is, do we alienate moderates by going more to the left, right? But for younger voters, I still think they're not necessarily sold on, on Biden or Harris in a lot of ways. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, we've been hosting debate watching parties with our young women um, and we have like a little Google doc and a chat box that we like communicate while we're um, watching the debate. And like the first question is like, what do you hope to hear from the candidates tonight? And as you can all recall from the first debate, it was hard to understand what the topics were. And so like the big piece in the post discussion was, are they ever gonna talk about, you know, the policies? Are we ever gonna talk about policy? So I think both camps still have that component to really think about. And really when we're looking at the issues that young people care about, here in California, like we are burning. <laughs> we literally have, you know, so many fires. The air quality is atrocious. You can't go for a walk in the morning. And so really thinking about why, you know, you can't even think about the other policies because you don't know if you're gonna have a community to even live in. And so I think it's each of those pieces that both campaigns still have a lot of work to do in terms of meeting young people where they're at and hopefully depending on where the next debate will be, that'll be another opportunity, but hopefully there'll be some more ways for both campaigns to be able to really illuminate to young people how they're prioritizing these policies. Mm -hmm. Nancy, do you feel that the candidates are doing specific outreach to older women at all? Um, it's interesting. We're always so happy when they speak about older people that, uh, uh, that uh, we kind of focus on that. I, I would say that although there isn't kind of an older woman's plank right. um, with either either candidate. Um, the issues that they're talking about suggest they certainly understand what resonates with older women. Um, so if you look at the caregiving agenda in the Biden campaign or the prescription drug agendas in both, mm -hmm. um, these speak loudly to older women. And um, and in some of the uh, discussions, there's been something more specific. Um, and I think that's what older older voters really are focused on. And um, and uh, again, uh, in, in terms of the older voter population, um, the key group are older women. Um, if you look at the shift um, that has gone, uh, at least in the polls, if not yet uh, in the election, um, from uh, President Trump to uh, Vice President Biden, it looks as if uh, that message is, is getting through. And as we know, COVID, COVID's everybody's issue, but COVID is really a woman's issue. Right. At least an older woman's issue. Melissa, um, I think it was in the Politico piece maybe this week that um, you reported in that discussion about sort of the temperament between mm -hmm the Gen Z and sort of the, that next step up, the millennials, um, where you see that Gen Z um, young women, especially being more willing to engage in conf you know, confrontation and being more combative and being unwilling to really wait oh. for a lot of change, right? It's just everything must happen now. Um, talk a little bit about that, that difference in terms of engagement in politics and you know, participating in politics. Yeah, sure. So I think that like many things in American politics today, uh, a lot of it boils down to social media. Yeah. Social media is, uh, it's ever present, but I'm finding that for young people in particular, um, Instagram, TikTok, all of these sorts of social media platforms uh, that 
are really revolutionizing revolutionizing the way that I think young people get involved in politics. Young women especially are adept at using them. And mm -hmm. so I think that there is an urgency um, so that young activists can kind of instantly put up a grant, a, sort of an Instagram of, of uh, data and facts. They can organize marches. I think that's why you saw record numbers of people walking in the streets um, this summer to protest racial inequality after George, George Floyd's killing. Um, and also those protests, it wasn't just people of color. It was very diverse. You had lots of young white women as well and white men involved in that. And I do think that there is just a sense of impatience with, with these individuals um, from the shooting at um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School that really, I think, um, radicalized a lot of young people who felt like they were let down, they're continually let down by grownups, by adults. And so these are what they consider to be very existential threats. The same thing with respect to climate. This is why you see so many young people involved in climate marches and climate activism. Um, they recognize that essentially uh, older people, older politicians from both parties have dropped the ball. And so I think that you're seeing really through social media, through this activism, a recognition that if, if it's going to change, it's going to have to be them make, being the change makers. And I think that is different than millennials, definitely. Sarah, do you pick up on that? Well, I'm a millennial, so <laughs> I think that there's a big dividing line. <laughs> Gen Z yeah. millennials. When, oh, yeah. you, when do you graduate into millennial status? Born after 1996. That's 96. really a okay. um, definition. So it'd be. Uh, Americans who are 18 to 23 or 24. Okay. Basically. And so millennials, I think, go to about 40 or so, yeah. maybe 40, 41. Yeah. 1981 was the first year, my son. Okay. <laughs> oh, now I got lost in the question. Um, do I see that differently with our young yeah. women? Yeah, or just do you do you pick up sort of this notion of really wanting change to happen immediately and, you know, being willing to be a little more confrontational on some of these issues. Yeah, I think that there's deep impatience like Melissa's getting at. I mean, Melissa's sat with young women both with Ignite and we've also sat with young women who have not been with Ignite. Yeah. And I think no matter which room we've been in, there's like a level of like, really? Is this really what our uh, question, you know, what we're talking about? Like in the debate watch party, the young women are like, what were debates like before Donald Trump was president? And so like, I mean, to to the point that was made earlier, it was this question of like, there is, there was a time where people definitely work together to create policy. And so I think that there is deep impatience. I also think that there's a lot of pieces and what we're doing at Ignite is really getting people to understand the importance of their vote because because you have so many failed systems, like thinking about what happened in Kentucky with Breonna Taylor, that yeah. is such a failed system. And if that's what is continuing in 2020, like how do I trust the system? And so that's a lot of the dialogue we're having with our young women of like, how do you continue to shift that? How do you play a role in that? And how do you not take a back seat? Because that will continue to happen if you don't adjust and um, and run for office yourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, you know, I, I'm excited about it. I think the big piece that we're really focused on at Ignite is how do we channel all of that energy to productivity? Right. Because if you don't channel it to productivity, you know, I can't tell you how many young people I have learned of suicide just in the past month of just how, when we're talking about anxiety and like depression and just how hard all of this is and the very big um, like confluence of how all of this is happening all at the same time when people don't have jobs, where they don't know if they're gonna be able to get COVID tested and everything is happening. Um, I think that's all really combined. And I really do hope that this election is one part of the story, but that there, I know that there are so many more puzzle pieces that we need to create for ourselves to really transition the narrative um, of our democracy. Um, Sydney has a question here in the audience um, about um, Kamala Harris um, being chosen as Biden's running mate. She wants to know if it's um, has changed women's feelings on the Biden campaign or has the net effect been ne negligible? Any sense of that? I'll say as a political scientist, um, yeah. studies have looked at VP choices for decades and honestly, <laughs> Have relatively little impact on how voters 
um, make up their minds. Uh, this is not to say that her historic nomination isn't important, right? I think that many women of color, especially um, African-American women, have been the backbone of the Democratic Party. So I think that for those women, Kamala Harris's selection was really important. And it signaled to them that the Democratic Party is not going to take their votes and their support for granted any longer. For younger people, though, to be perfectly honest, a lot of them are a little leery of her record as a as a prosecutor when she was, you know, the attorney general of the state of California, a lot of them felt like her record on criminal justice wasn't that great. I don't know if Sarah remembers, we started doing these focus groups uh, in the summer of 2019 of Ignite participants. And so this was when the field, of course, was wide open among the Democratic Party. And we mentioned different names and Kamala Harris, they kept saying, oh, she's a cop. She's not, we don't, we don't support her. She's a cop, right? And so, and I think that kind of leads into this lack of enthusiasm a lot of younger people have for, for the Biden-Harris ticket. Um, at the same time though, I think that many older women voters are very happy that he selected a woman, a woman of substance to be on the ticket because I think again, shows the importance of women voters to the Democratic Party base. Yeah. Nancy, did you pick up on any of that in any of the- yeah, we yeah. We haven't we haven't polled specifically on it, but I think uh, based on things I've seen over the years, um, for older women, it is significant to see a woman on uh, the the ballot um, and the possibility of a woman occupying uh, the vice presidency. But um, but I also agree with you that over the years, as we've polled on whether you know, something made a difference. The vice presidential candidate was not significant um, in, in people's thinking. There's um, one more um, Kamala re related question from Gloria who um, says that when uh, she was named, we were told that her colored sorority and other African-American sororities would turn out in force to campaign for her. I have not heard about these efforts. Have you, with what impact? Uh, either any of you have a thought on on that, I've, I've just seen uh, a couple things here and there about it, but I would assume that sort of COVID has uh, put a damper on some of those larger kind of rallies and that kind of thing as well, right? Yeah, I saw a photo on Instagram from her sorority of all of them wearing their shirts and the skirts. I, don't know I saw that too, it. yeah. They all were wearing their masks to the ballot to do early voting. Yeah. Um, I But I don't know much. I'm not a sorority person, so I can't totally answer that. But um, I did just want to add to the yeah. last question too, sure. really quick. The other piece that we asked in the survey in, Mar in May was, what would take you to the ballot box and like what would change that and it was really thinking about how could i um vote for folks that like had more connection to me and one of them was being um, more women of color and so i think that there's that piece for gen z i do agree with both of you that there is a lack of discrepancy of utter joy for both biden and kamala as a ticket together and that's like and that is part of the piece but i think for a lot of Gen Zers right now, and for millennials even too, I would go to say that like, they know that that is not the end all, <laughs> that electing Biden and Kamala doesn't solve everything, but there is so much more to do after election day. Um, I also feel like um, this whole issue of the court too, uh, started out as a little bit maybe of a bigger deal than it's turning out to be, but I don't know if that's just because there's so much else going on right now, but, um, Sarah, I'm curious too about young women and the issue of the court. Uh, does any of this resonate with them? I, you know, certainly so many younger women um, admired RBG and, you know, we sort of know that kind of pop culture status that she had. But are they tuned in to um, this latest um, confirmation hearing? Yeah, and it's fascinating because they're like, we know that she's a woman, but it's not the one we want. Right, right, right. So that's also an interesting narrative. And I think a lot of them are very curious why this is happening during an election cycle and like why right now. And so I think they're definitely tuned into it. I mean, the joy of school from home <laughs> is that you can have something else on the screen or another thing. Um, um, in the sideline, just like in DC, the, the news is always playing everywhere you go. Um, and so I think for a lot of our young women that are tuned in, but the bigger question is like, why right now can't we get through the election um, and wait for that? Interesting. Um, Nancy, let me ask you this, this kind of goes along with this, this is a question from um, Natalie, 
um, who said, how do older voters talk uh, about and consider reproductive rights? Is that something that they cite as a motivator for voting? And where does it fall on the spectrum of policy issues? Um, it, it typically is not very high. Um, mm -hmm. It's not to say it's not important to a lot of women and many women who have advocated uh, on either side of the issue over the years, but it typically is not uh, top of mind, at least in the polling we've seen and we've done. Um, and again, um, this broad area of healthcare um, encompasses so much that um, probably if you unpack it, you'd find more about some of the specifics um, but but most of what we've seen is concerned about concerned about healthcare costs. Yes. And another another point I make in 2018 we did a lot of polling, and in, um, I remember we were in Florida shortly after the shooting, and we were in Arizona a short while after one of the big uh, immigration stories. Uh, I can't remember which which one, and we were quite sure that those issues would just be at the top of the list for older voters. Uh, gun safety and immigration were both higher than we might have expected in other times. But again, Social Security, Medicare, healthcare costs were overwhelmingly what people were focused on. Um, Melissa, yeah, do you have thoughts on that? And also, I'm curious, um, for uh, your thoughts on, um, you know, how women over time change and maybe realign themselves politically as they do get older, are they drawn more toward a conservative side? Does think do things change once they have a family? What do we know about how women change over time on that political spectrum? Sure. Um, let me just say something very quickly about reproductive rights. Sure. Yeah. Um, we know really since Roe versus Wade. Uh, public opinion has been pretty stable when it comes to the attitudes about abortion. But I'm finding, and, and Sarah and I are finding in our research, that um, Gen Z women are more liberal on abortion attitudes. And I think part of it is because they've now grown up in an era um, in many states that have regulated and made it uh, very difficult to get access to reproductive rights. And so I think it's become a more salient issue for Gen Z mm -hmm. and voters mm -hmm. than I've ever seen historically. And in fact, in some of my research for my book, um, I have these pretty complex statistical models. And so I control for attitudes about abortion. And I find that pro-choice women are significantly more likely to be engaged in politics, even controlling for other things. So I think this is an issue potentially that'll be interesting to watch in the future because we have um, younger women who've been not just, I think, motivated by reproductive rights, but also about gender equality more generally. Um, the Me Too movement was an important socializing experience for these women. Um, the election of Donald Trump saying such awful misogynist things. I think a lot of younger women couldn't believe someone like that could be elected president. And so this actually leads into your second question about over time, do attitudes actually shift? And so in political science, we often talk about the impressionable years theory. And so this is this idea is that when you were socialized um, in your late teens and early 20s, um, with your political views, they really have a, a long held pattern in terms of explaining how you vote later on. And so of course we have changes over time in terms of looking at party identification and people's attitudes might change, but it's really remarkable the extent to which your, your views and attitudes and your party ID stays very similar um, when you're a young adult. And we see that pattern over time. Studies of millennials, a lot of people thought that millennials, oh, they'll get married, they'll have kids, they'll lean more conservatively, um, but that really hasn't materialized. And so I think you're seeing really the vanguard of a far more progressive um, group of Americans who want more progressive change led by Gen Z, but also millennials who have very similar views as well. Hmm. Nancy, do you have thoughts on that? How women sort of as they, as they mature um, change politically at all? No, um, you know, the, the view has been they don't change hugely after yeah. um, a, a certain age. But, but again, I look at the data from 2018 and, uh, and at least what we're seeing so far in, in 2020, and, and I do wonder in terms mm -hmm. of the, the older voter. And I think, look, if, if these numbers hold um, and through the election, I think, um, you know, 
Democrats might look at them and say, well, we did well with this group that we hadn't done well with for ages in 2018 and 2020. Um, maybe the tide has turned. And I think Republicans might look and say, older voters have always been our staple. Um, you know, what's going on there? So there may be more uh, kind of focus on them and to see if there are opportunities to get people to uh, to switch. In general, older voters are typically more conservative, mm-hmm. but um, I, I don't I don't know how it how it sorts. And I'll give you one example. My hope is that out of all of this, we have an agenda that is multi-generational um, moving forward. And I think issues um, like pay equity uh, for women, uh, things like that are, look, I wake up every day and think about retirement security for older Americans. And there are all kinds of things you can do to try to get people to put a little bit more money into a 401k. Right. But it would be a lot better if they were paid more in their first job out of college or out of high school or out of community college or whatever. Well, yeah, because we know that builds, yeah. you know, build yeah, it. yeah, um, for sure. Um, well, we'll have twenty days uh, until the election, <laughs> um, and it'll be very curious to see how all of this plays out. Uh, certainly, something to be looking for as we kind of dive through all of the exit polls um, after the election as well. Um, I do want to share before we go um, uh, two more uh, women on Wednesdays that we have. Uh, coming up that we hope you will join us for. Um, Next Wednesday, we're having a discussion about Republican women uh, in 2020. A few weeks ago, we had um, the folks from Emily's list here talk about Democratic women. And so these um, two groups are sort of those counterparts for Republican women, uh, View Pack and Winning for Women. So Julie Conway and uh, Rebecca Schuler uh, will be here um, then to talk with us. And then... um, the week after that, the week right before the election, we are going to um, have a discussion about political engagement um, and um, with the director and producer of a new documentary that's um, out, just came out and is now in some of the film festivals um, called We Sisterhood. Um, and we'll have some of the um, activists that she spotlights in this film. Um, and we do have the film available, a link to um uh, to watch the film, it'll be on our website, and then we'll have a discussion um, with Cheryl uh, and some of those uh, activists after that. So we hope you can uh, join us uh, for that as well um, in just a few weeks. Um, so with that, I want to thank our guests today for joining us, Sarah and, and Nancy and Melissa. A lot of information, terrific, fascinating, interesting, and like I said, we'll we'll see what happens in 20 days. <laughs> 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 and uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Great. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.